Hi, welcome to YTV and this week's segment of Everybody Has a Story. Ari Shavit is a leading Israeli columnist and writer and the New York Times best-selling author of My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. And he joins us today. Ari, thanks so much for being here. Great to be with you. So you wrote this book with a very interesting structure. Uh, you, you weave together personal history and odyssey with a broader Israeli history. How did that decision come about? Did this start off as a memoir, or did it start off intending to be a national history? No, not as a personal memoir. Um, I had a strong notion that one of the main problems in the Israel debate, in Israel discussion regarding Israel, both in Israel, in America, and elsewhere, is that people have lost touch with the larger picture. There's so much into the details, the friction, the daily events, the debates, the ones that we should have, that we lost touch of, of the context. And in many ways, I thought that the Israel narrative, both for those who love Israel and the ones who are critical of Israel, has disintegrated. So I, what I try to do is, in a sense, rewrite the narrative in a personal way that only I'm committed to by bringing back the sense that this is a great human story. That wherever you stand, again, where you're critical and where you are, like me, committed to it, you have to see that Israel is an astonishing human endeavor. And that you have to put the politics uh, in the context of this fascinating uh, historical happening that in many ways is unique. We talk a lot about getting the Israeli narrative right, getting the story right, uh, but why is that an important piece? Are, are narratives important to diplomacy? Oh, sure. First of all, you know, the reason Israel attracts so much attention, again, negative and positive, is that it's the, 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 the Jewish story, you know, you know throughout uh, the last millenniums and centuries, but definitely in the last century, has been such a charged story. I mean, the combination of the tragedy, the horrific past, then the achievements, then the flaws and the mistakes, that I think creates a kind of, of uh, uh, interest in so many people who don't live there or don't necessarily, you know, are so political. So the narrative, what is it really about? And is, is essential. And, and, and the questions I try to ask, actually, are not just the occupation and settlement issues, on which I have a very strong opinion, but I try to ask the basic question of, you know, why Israel and, and, and what's Israel? Uh, and really answering it with the human stories, with, the, with, 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 with bringing back the sense of the great drama uh, that Israel is. Uh, and, and, and in a sense really trying to describe this, this unique phenomena of, of vitality against all odds that, that in my mind that's what Israel is about. Well, let's talk about the, the subtitle of the book because that uh, really paints a narrative uh, in, a, in a, a short way, which is the triumph and, and tragedy. And in this history, I mean, a lot of times that's simultaneous. Uh, the most vivid example is the story of, of the expulsion and massacre in Lida in 1948. But you talk about this tragedy and, and you say that it, it, it was crucial to the Zionist revolution and to laying the foundation for a Jewish state. Are you saying that these are necessary tragedies? <sighs> Tragedy by definition is something that is almost inevitable. Either totally inevitable or almost inevitable. But let me say something about the triumph first. The triumph is Israel is a triumph of the human spirit. You don't have to be an Israeli or Jewish or a supporter of Israel to see that what you see in Israel is a, an inspiring story of a people who faced extinction, people who were the ultimate victims of the 20th century who saved themselves at the very last moments by creating this unique enterprise, social, political enterprise. So 
in my mind, uh, as there are so many people who are so critical of Zionism this day, and it's perceived as a dirty word by many, I think that the Zionist endeavor, the Zionist revolution, was basically just more impressive, and it can be a source of inspiration to many other people around the world. Because faced with the most dramatic challenge that people can face, the challenge of extinction, the early founders, founding mothers and fathers of Israel, have came up with this unique idea, and actually, you know, transferred the people from one continent to another, and again, in the most difficult circumstances, built this vibrant, lively society. And in so many ways, the dream they had was not fulfilled. You know, Israel is not perfect in any way; it's flawed in many ways don't have the old utopia there, but it's so vibrant and, and innovative and creative. And in many ways, I think it's a kind of phenomena of celebration of life, of a people who, 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 who face uh, dramatic danger in the past and in the future. Where is the tragedy? The tragedy is the conflict. Because what these people did not anticipate is that when they come, when we came back to our ancient home, we were blind to see that there were other people there, the Palestinians. The Palestinians were also blind to see that we are a people, that we have some rights as well. And beyond that, as we now are so aware, the Middle East, to which we came back, is it's such a troubling region that is so violent and extremist that it goes back to tribalism and violence. So the tension in Israel's existence in between the need to have it to need to have a home for the homeless people. The beauty of it, the, 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 the richness, the human, human richness of it. And on the other hand, the fact that we are caught in this 100-year war that refuses to stop. And the climax of that tragedy, of that conflict, came in 1948, what I described. So that was, yes, in my mind, it was almost an inevitable result of the sequence of tragic events that was caused by the fact that we were blind to see the Palestinians and the Palestinians were blind to see us. But is that the same case today? I mean, we, we saw uh, the violence that broke out this summer. Is this type of violence, is this type of war and tragedy inherent to the day-to-day -day existence of Israel? I'm afraid that so far it is. I want it to change. But in order to have a different uh, way of coexistence that is more peaceful in order to eventually have peace. We really have, first of all, to change our state of mind. We have to see the Palestinians and they have to see us. We have to recognize their rights. They have to recognize our rights. And if this is not the case, and I'm afraid that this is not yet the case, I don't yet see ripeness for the overall peace, we have to find new ways to promote you know, what I call new peace, a different approach that would create two-state dynamics that will eventually lead to a two-state state and would enable us to limit occupation, to stop settlement, but at the same time not to take risks that can endanger us. Because what we've seen in the last decade or two, and even this year, is that attempts to bring about a perfect final peace that is not there when they collapse, when these benign efforts collapse, they bring about violence. This is what we saw this year. This is what we saw with the Gaza War of 2014. So in order to prevent the occurrence of such terrible events and this ongoing intensified tragedy, I think it's time for us to look afresh at the problem and come up with creative ideas that will give a reasonable future to both Israelis and Palestinians. We talk about state of mind and perception Israel has gone from being you know, that kind of beacon of hope and the, the scrappy democracy in the Middle East to being the bully in many people's minds in the region. Uh, when did that begin? When did that perception start to change? Well, I think, first of all, I do not share this new perception. I am very critical of many of Israel's policies. I oppose occupation. I always thought that settlements are a bad idea. And I'm critical of my government and previous government in many ways. And yet, I think that this perception that you talk about, that sadly is there, 
is totally wrong. It's totally flawed. Because uh, I think that many people look at Israel's strength and they feel that it's some sort of major power while the others are weaker. And this is not quite the case because at the end of the day, when you look at the real historical perspective, the Jewish people is still a small, lowly people. Israel is a tiny democracy in an ocean of extremism. And Israel is, although it is perceived as a cliche, Israel is the only vibrant democracy in the Middle East. Perhaps Tunisia will join us soon. We'll see if, if the Tunisian experiment works. But when you see it, all the extremism around, when you see the human catastrophe in Syria, when you see ISIS, when you see what's happening in Iraq, when you see the tyranny in Egypt, when you see all that is around Israel, you have to acknowledge the fact that Israel is a bastion of freedom and the only place in the Middle East where you have a really free society, where women have equality, not good enough, but equality, where gays have their rights, not good enough, but they do have them when other minorities can express themselves, people can vote and be elected. In this sense, Israel is an astonishing kind of frontier democracy. And, and I, I wish people, while criticizing what's wrong about Israeli policies, will see that because there are two elements here. One is the Jewish story that we do, and I think you do not have to be Jewish in order to understand that there is a need to have a home for the Jewish people that will preserve Jewish civilization that is liberal, modern, and democratic. And the other element is the democratic element, because again, with all its flaws and problems, Israel is a vibrant democracy, and you do have a robust free society there. And what I hope is that we'll find a way in Israel to overcome occupation, to stop settlement, so people like you and people watching us would acknowledge the beauty and the morality and the justice and the inspiration that there is in Israel rather than just the daily friction and violence. We talked a, a little already about the war uh, in, in Gaza this summer, um, but you supported those operations, but you've also been a, a prominent critic of Prime Minister Netanyahu. There seems to be a, a, a difference between the Israeli left and the American left or the global left. Can you describe that gap? Surely. As I said, I would want Israel to be much more energetic in its pursuit of peace. And again, if peace in the kind of naive, perfect way is not possible, let's work out on some reasonable peace funds. And let's try to deal with occupation and stop settling. But all this has to be put in context. And I ask my peace-loving liberal friends in this country and in Israel to look at the recent history. And we have to acknowledge the fact that Israelis opened their hearts to peace several times in 1993 19, with Oslo, 2000 with the peace uh, summit in King David, 2008 with the Annapolis process. And all these attempts have failed. And this is what led to this terrible Gaza war. One of the reasons that I thought Israel has a right to defend itself is that on Gaza, we did the right thing. We did what the international community wanted us to do. Our right-wing prime minister at the time, Ariel Sharon, who was perceived as a very extremist figure, did at the end exactly what all peaceniks in America and Israel wanted him to do. I put some pressure of my own on that. So we pulled out of Gaza, we dismantled all the settlements, no checkpoints, no occupying army. And yet the result is not the emergence of a vibrant Palestinian democracy. The result is a Hamas controlled territory with, uh, controlled by a, 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 an extreme religious organization that keeps attacking Israel. So when Israel was attacked, I think I thought that we have a right to defend ourselves. Look, there is no doubt what President Obama would have done if America, if New York would have been attacked by rockets day after day after day after day. Even under the most peace-loving president, America would have acted in a very robust way. So Israel had to defend itself. And yet, I was, first of all, saddened by the tragedy of the summer. 
I had some criticism of certain acts that were taken while the fighting got went on. And I hope that we'll find ways to defend ourselves that are less, uh, that, that bring less suffering and, 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 and human, 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 uh, such human cause. So it was a horrible tragedy. It's not that I support every act that the Israeli army took, but by and large, Israel have, first of all, Israel has the right to defend itself and it had to defend itself. I think that really we, we, we have, if we want peace and we have to address the brutal reality of the Middle East. We cannot promote peace in a kind of naive, starry-eyed way. I think that if we'll do that, if we'll see the darker forces out there in the region, if we'll see the depth of the tragedy of the conflict, I think we can uh, come up with a new approach that will be much more productive and constructive in promoting real peace than just uh, uh, being purist and 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 you know ignoring some of these difficult realities. So we talk about Israel's right to defend itself. So let's shift into another major threat, which is uh, Iran. Uh, what do you think a, a nuclear Iran means for both Israel and the United States, and, and does it mean different things for the different countries? I'm I'm. Again, I'm saddened to see that Iran has been very, has very much become an Israel issue, even a specifically a Benjamin Netanyahu issue. I think sh this should not be the case. I think if Iran will go nuclear, that will endanger all of us. Americans, Israelis, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, Europeans, I think all humans, but definitely all citizens of the free world. Because if Iran will go nuclear, I don't think that it will necessarily use the bomb the next day against Israel. I, do, I don't think it will. But the result will be a nuclear Middle East, the end of the world order as we see it, and the great achievement of the international community in the last 70 years, which was to control the nuclear genie, will be endangered. So if Iran will go nuclear, that will have immediate effect, psychologically, economically, politically, on Tel Aviv. But it will affect life in New Haven and in, in America. So I really think I do not. I'm not into. I'm not uh, an Iran hawk in the sense that I do not support the military strike. But I think that we should had a much more assertive diplomatic approach to it years ago, and I think it's not too late to do it now. And I think again, I ask especially my liberal and peace-loving friends to realize that this is not an issue to be soft on. You don't have to be a hawk, you don't have to be conservative, you don't have to be an Israeli to realize that Iran will, a nuclear Iran, will threaten us all, will threaten our values and our way of life. So let's unite regarding this challenge, not having internal fights about it, and look for, again, an assertive diplomatic uh, approach that will diffuse this issue. Well, looking forward, You've called uh, many times for a revitalized Zionism, a liberal progressive Zionism that especially focuses on, on young people. In the United States, th there's no secret that there is a, a declining support of Israel among American Jews. What do you think Israel can do better uh, uh, to inspire more support in the United States, especially among young people? And what does that revitalized Zionism look like? It's, 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 it's uh, it's something that I give a lot of thought to these days. You know, after writing my book and as I travel through the country, um, I really think that it's time for us to to understand again that Israel is especially essential for non ultra orthodox Jews throughout the world. And one of the things that trouble me about Israeli politics in the last decades, that it seems that the Israeli political system was overtaken by ultra-Orthodox parties and extreme nationalists. And these two forces drive away young American Jews, young diaspora Jews, who are liberal, who have universal values, and cannot relate to, and cannot be inspired by an Israel that is a settler Israel and an 
ultra-religious Israel. So I think it's our role as Israelis to fix Israel, first of all for ourselves, to go back to our, our humane and liberal and strongly democratic values. But it's also our commitment to Jews throughout the world, and especially young Jews. Because if we will not fix Israel, and if we will not change Israel, we are endangering the Jewish future. So I'm looking forward for a kind of alliance, renewed alliance, between young Jews of the diaspora, mainly American Jews, and young Israeli uh, Jews and non-Jews, to work on not only you know, getting the world right, but really trying to find a mission for our people and to have an Israel as a beacon of freedom, of social justice, not a state of, that is uh, associated with occupation and extreme politics. I think that if we change these dynamics and if we, we regain uh, the control over, over, over Israel and bring it back to what it should be, we'll be both doing the right thing for Israel, but we'll also uh, make Israel again relevant and attractive for young American Jews. And lastly, uh, your book uh, is a lot about memory and, and both historical and, and personal memory, but you make the case that a, a lot of the issues, what's at the heart of this conflict are the events of 1948 and the existence uh, of Israel uh, itself. With that being the case, are you hopeful that peace is possible? I'm hopeful that we'll bring about a, a new kind of peace. I think that it'll be very difficult to achieve, again, the final status peace agreement that we hoped for in the 1990s and the 2000s. We tried it several times, it failed, and the Arab chaos and extremism in the Arab world and in Israel, it's not the same, but we have extremism in Israel as well, make it very difficult to achieve right now. Therefore, I think we should launch a different kind of process where we begin a two-state process state, we launch two-state dynamics that lead to a kind of two-state state that will eventually lead to a two-state solution. So let's not try, you know, to have an all-or-nothing approach. Even if the utopian peace that we want cannot be reached right now, we have to deal with occupation, we have to work with moderate Palestinians on creating a kind of de facto peace even before there is formal peace. I think that if we bring about that concept and if we bring into this an alliance with moderate Arabs and if America will take the leadership on really promoting this kind of new, more modest, but more real and concrete peace, then I think there is a real hope, again, first of all, to have more stability, more justice, peaceful coexistence in the short term, and eventually, long term, hopefully we will have the deep reconciliation that we pray for. Ari Shabi, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. The book is My Promised Land for YTV. I'm Cody Pomerantz, and this has been Everybody Has a Story. See you next time.